I'm Hug, this is The Dice, and this time my lovely patrons on Patreon have voted for me to talk about on Kailak If you'd like some influence on the topics of future Irish folklore videos, then please sign up as a patron, and you'll get to vote in the polls. Kailak is an Irish word meaning hag, and on Kailak Vara means the hag of Barra, Barra being a peninsula in West Cork is in the southwest of Ireland. Now our modern understanding of Ancaillac Vara is probably very different to what the original, older, more ancient interpretations of her would have been. As the legend of Ancaillac Vara has sublimated itself throughout the country, it has grown to expand and to absorb stories of other hag figures, other Kailaks, from around the country. As I said, the name Ancaillac Vara comes from the Barra Peninsula in County Cork. And usually, Ancaillac Vara would have been depicted as a spindly old woman wearing a veil or a shawl upon her head. But in the earliest stories, she wasn't always depicted as an old, ancient woman. It was said that she aged in cycles, having passed through seven periods of youth. Each time she had a husband whom she would grow old with, and when that husband died, her youth would reset and she would go and find herself another. And this sets Ancaillac Vara up as a figure that would have seen much of Ireland's history lived for centuries and observed an awful lot of what was going on in Ireland. Now this is very similar to the figure of Fintan, who is a character we'll be talking about in another video at some other point. She had children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren with each of her seven husbands. And but more than that, she was also said to have adopted over 50 foster children. Now her children and grandchildren, they were said to have gone on to begin a whole new races, tribes and families within Ireland. And that idea of the Kailak as a matriarchal figure for multiple tribes and peoples across the island of Ireland shows that she would have had a lot of strength as a figure of sovereignty within Irish Ireland, a figure of rulership. But more than that, the fostering of so many children would have helped cement that position as well. You see, in ancient Ireland, fostering was considered a display of great wealth and great compassion. A foster parent would have as much, if not more, responsibility to a foster child than they would to their own flesh and blood. And so one could not really afford to take in many foster children unless one had a great deal of wealth, but also doing so, being willing to take on that additional responsibility was an act of kindness. But fostering also had political implications. You see, in ancient Ireland, Families would often exchange children to raise them in foster age, and they would do this to strengthen political alliances or to bring peace between two previously feuding families. This was a very good way of building, strengthening political alliances, and so with over 50 foster children, that also shows a great deal of political manoeuvring, of political canniness that would be important in a figure of sovereignty, of rulership. As if all that weren't enough to explain why Ancaillac Vara may have been seen as a figure of sovereignty in Ireland, there is also the fact that she is said to have influenced and created parts of the landscape of Ireland. There are many standing stones throughout the country, and many of them are said to have been animals or people that Ancaillac Vara had turned to stone. It's also said that many of the castles and round towers throughout Ireland were built by Ancaillac Vara using three pocketfuls of stones. This influence over the landscape and having created parts of it doesn't just represent sovereignty, but also a deep connection to the land itself. A deep connection to the land itself was an important part 
of Irish sovereignty. Kings would often have to symbolically marry the land itself in order to cement their position. And so the act of performing feats that help to shape the landscape, it shows that on Kailach Vara may have been seen as part of an embodiment of the land, much like other sovereignty figures such as Macha or Eru. Originally, on Kailach Vara would have been a figure mostly recognised within the southeast of the land. However, there were other unrelated Kailach figures throughout the northeast and the midlands of Ireland that weren't on Kailach Vara. They were mostly associated with the harvest, with protecting wild spaces and wild animals. And they would have had different functions. They would have been much closer to the ordinary witch. They would have been stripped of much of Ang Kailach Vara's aspects of sovereignty and embodiment of the land. However, as recognition of Ang Kailach Vara spread northwest, these smaller Kailach figures ended up being absorbed within her legend. And so we've come to the point where An Kailach Vara is said to have two different homes. One on the island of Bui, just off the uh, Vara Peninsula, and the other all the way on the opposite corner of the island of Ireland, on the top of Sleeve Gillen a passage tomb called the Kylock's House. Now undoubtedly this was originally supposed to be the house of an unrelated Kylock figure, a completely different hag witch figure that later became absorbed into the mythology of Al Kylock Vara. There are interesting aspects to look at in how the stories of Al Kylock Vara may have been influenced by absorbing these smaller one might even say lesser Kylock figures from around the country. Let's go into a story now. Fado, Fado. There were a dozen young men in County Antrim. They were penniless and looking for work. They were walking all over the county looking for people who had odd jobs for them to do. And so they heard that the Kailach up on Schlieve Gillen was looking for people to harvest her grain. And nobody in the local area would do it for her. And so the twelve, they went up to the top of Schlieve Gillen. They went to the Kailach's house. And they said, well, we've heard you're looking for someone to help harvest your grain. We'd be very happy to do it with you. And the Kailach, she was delighted. She told them to come back the next morning and that they would begin the harvest. And so they turned up the next day with their sickles and their scythes. And all thirteen of them, the twelve young men and the Kailak herself, they began to harvest the grain. Now, on Kailak Vara, she could reap grain faster than any mortal man. So she set to at the end of the field with all the young men spread out ahead of her. And she was swinging her sickle back and forth as she was catching up on the young man just in front of her. And as she caught up with him, she sliced off his legs with her sickle. And she kept on reaping, just leaving him there to die. Now as she continued on, she was swinging her sickle back and forth. And she began catching up on a second young man. And when she did so, she sliced off his legs with the sickle. And like the first, she just left him there, and she kept on reaping. And this happened over and over again. There was only one young man left of the twelve who had come to help her. Just as it seemed, she was about to catch up on him. And he was going to suffer the same fate as the others. The sun began to set, and she called out, That's enough work for tonight. We'll go back to the house and have our dinner. We'll pick this back up in the morning. And so they went back up to the top of the mountain to have their dinner. And the remaining young man, he was understandably terrified. He knew that if something didn't happen tonight, just slow down the Kyla. And they began leaping again in the morning, he would die 
like the other in it. And the Kylock's daughter, she was going to take him at this one, man. She took him aside. She would say. Without the Kylock's <laughs> lady. She explained that the Kylock's sickle had three teeth on the inside of the blade. And that those teeth were the reason for the Kylock's inhuman swiftness in reaping the grain. She said if he could find some way of knocking those teeth out without the Kylock knowing it was him, then he might be able to save his life. And so he crept out into the field at the dead of night with iron spikes. And he hammered them into the ground at different points along the Kylock's swart of grain. And he's back inside. And so the next morning, the Kylock, she summons the young man down and they head down to the field to continue. And he's set up far ahead of her again. And they start to take in the grain. And the Kylock, she's swinging her sickle back and forth, moving faster than any mortal man could reap. And it looks like she's just about to catch up on the young man when there is a sudden clash of metal on metal. And she looks at her sickle, and one of the teeth has been broken. She looks down and sees the iron spike, and she rips it out of the ground and throws it from the field. And she begins reaping again. Now she's moving a little bit slower now, but still faster than any mortal man could manage. And she's swinging her sickle back and forth. She's beginning to catch up on the young man again. And it seems like she's just about to strike him down when there is a second clatter of metal on metal. She looks at the blade of her sickle and a second tooth has been knocked off it. She looks down and sees the iron spike sticking out of the ground and she rips it out with one hand and throws it from the feet. And then she sets to reaping again, swinging her sickle back and forth. She slowed down a little bit, but is still moving faster than any mortal man. And she begins catching up on the young man again. And just as it seems he's about to lose his legs and his life, there is a third clash of metal on metal. The final tooth has been knocked from her sickle. She looks down and sees the iron spike. She tears it out of the ground and throws it from the field. She begins reaping. Now she is only as fast as a very strong young man, but still only as fast as a mortal. And even though she's only as fast as a mortal man, now she still begins to catch up on the young man. And just as it seems, she's about to strike him down. He sees. She's just finished. All of the grain has been cut. The harvest is finished. And so, they gather up all of the sheafs of grain. They carry it up to the Kylox house. The Kyla, very happily, pays this young man the wages of all twelve of the men who had arrived to help her. <laughs> Left with the full wages? And no intention of ever harvesting for the Kylock ever again. But the Kylock herself, she was delighted with the harvest. What's intriguing about this story is while the Kylock shows no remorse for killing any of these young men, she also seems to show no enjoyment or malice in doing so either, as if she sees no difference between reaping them and the grain around them. As I said earlier, On Kylock Varro was a story that began in County Cork, in the southwest of Ireland, and that for a long time was where it was best known. Now the southwest of Ireland is often associated with the other world, and in particular the death aspects of the other world. And as we discussed, Onkylok Vara may have been an embodiment of 
the land. And one of the nastier aspects of embodying the land is being an embodiment of death. So what I think happened is that when on Kailak Vara, the stories about her, her legend, absorbed and assimilated the Kailaks of the harvest in the Midlands and the northeast of Ireland. The literal idea of the Kailak of the harvest being a reaper became a metaphorical idea for on Kailak Vara's death aspects and the two became the same thing. What was once a literal reaper became a metaphorical reaper as well through very obvious imagery. Through some... What was once a literal reaper became a metaphorical reaper through some very, very obvious imagery. Thank you for watching this video on On Kailak Varak, and thank you to all of my patrons that you can see scrolling across the screen there, or you can see at least the $5 tier there, and thank you to all of the others as well. It's because of them that I've been able to afford to upgrade my equipment. I recently got a new soundboard, which is helping out a lot. I can use my old shotgun mic again. And also, I bought a new camera yesterday morning, so I'm going to be able to do more camera angles and have slightly better video quality in the future, which is going to be very nice. I'm very glad about that. Oh, also a big thank you to the owner and manager of the Leprechaun Museum, where I work, for taking us all on that lovely field trip to Schlieve Gillen, to the Kylox house, where I got the uh, tiny little bit of B-roll that I used in this video. That was really good. It was a fun trip. I enjoyed it. If you want to support the channel, you can, of course, like, comment, share. Those are the primary means. They're very useful. But you can also support me on Patreon or donate to Co my Kofi. The link for that is in the description. We also have merchandise uh, on Society6 that you can go look at. And uh, I, I think that's most of it. I've got some audiobooks on Bandcamp. But uh, th th that'd be about it. That's everything. Alright, so thank you, and uh, just remember that your applause is the only way to counteract my daily chant of I don't believe in fairies.